Hello, and welcome to the eOrganic webinar on the economics of organic dairy farming in New England, presented by Dr. Bob Parsons of the University of Vermont. My name is Deb Haliba, and I work at the University of Vermont Extension as eOrganic's dairy team coordinator. eOrganic is an online community of more than 600 ag service providers and farmers who are providing science, experience, and regulation-based certified organic information on the web. With funding from the USDA Integrated Organic Program, we publish articles, videos, and other content at eextension.org. You will be able to find the recording of this webinar, information about upcoming webinars, and more on our website at www.eextension.org slash organic underscore production. Before we get started, I wanted to give a quick rundown of today's webinar. This webinar will run for one hour and 15 minutes. Bob will give his presentation that will run for about 45 minutes. And at the end of Bob's presentation, we will hold a question and answer session to respond to any questions you may have. To pose a question, you will need to type it into the question or chat box <laughs> that should appear on the right-hand side of your computer screen. If you can't see the question box, click the plus sign next to the box to open it up. We will hold off responding to questions until Bob has finished, so please keep that in mind when you are typing in your question. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Robert Parsons as our speaker today. Bob is an agricultural economist in the Department of Community Development and Applied Economics at the University of Vermont. He received his Master's of Science degree in Agricultural Economics and Operations Research from Penn State University and his PhD in Agricultural Economics from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. Bob joined us here at the University of Vermont in uh, 2000 with a research and, and extension appointment where he has conducted numerous educational programs on business management, farm succession, dairy economics, ag labor management, and risk management. In addition, he teaches undergraduate courses, including ag policy. In 2004, Bob and a research team from Vermont and Maine received a grant from the USDA Integrated Organic Program to conduct the project Profitability and Transitional Analysis of New England Organic Dairy Farms. This is one of the few studies across the US that has looked at the economics of organic dairy farming. His presentation today draws on that research as well as subsequent data he has collected from area organic dairy farms. Bob, thank you very much for joining us today. Okay, thank you, Deb. I'm uh, going to be taking a look at maybe what you call an economic overview, but it's going to be a summary of uh, the last five years of uh, economic data that we've gathered from organic dairy farms in New England, which essentially is Maine and Vermont. Let's see here. Why do we have organic dairy in New England? Well, we have found that we almost have the greatest concentration of organic dairy farms in the U.S. Doesn't mean we have the most organic farms, the greatest concentration. Maine, we have about 72 organic dairy farms. Vermont is about 200 right now. Out of our total of just a little over 1,000 dairy farms, we're looking at about 20% or one out of every five dairy farms in Vermont is an organic dairy farm. And in the current dairy climate out there, if we had free sign up for organic, we would have a heck of a lot more joining the ranks if they possibly could as compared to the current conventional dairy farms. When we take a look at the, uh, when we started the study, which was funded by the USDA DA Integrated Organic Program, we had a simple question. We had some old data from 1999 about some uh, the returns from organic dairy farms and a lot of people, lenders, policymakers, other farmers were asking, gee, I hear those organic dairy farmers get a lot for their milk, but what's their bottom line like? Well, if you don't know something like that, you go out and you get the information. So with the cooperation with the University of Maine, we put in a grant to the Integrated Organic Program as well as through some hatch funds at the University of Vermont. And we've been collecting data for the five, last five years, and we are currently obtaining economic data for the sixth year from organic dairy farms in Vermont. As you can see, we got 30 farms in 2004. Our highest was like in 2005 when we got 44 farms. In 
starting in 2007, just due to manpower constraints, uh, Maine could not uh, obtain their data from their farms, so we've been going the last two years just on Vermont farms. Now, we wanted to know how well are these farms doing, so let's take a look. This is kind of an overview of what we looked at. In 2004, we found that organic dairy farms were not doing very well. They were actually doing worse than the conventional dairy farms that in that year. And when you take a look at the average milk price at that time was only $22.97, uh, they really weren't generating enough income uh, to actually support a family cost of living, which we have used at $35,000 for this study. So as we take a look up through there, we've seen the price jump from close $23 in 2004. By 2006, we're seeing the milk, average milk price pushing nearly $29, and in 2008, we've seen the average organic milk price uh, getting close $31 per hundredweight. That is with components and uh, other paid bon uh, quality bonuses. One thing that we've found and has been very consistent through, through the years of the study, milk production has ranged in the you know, realm from a little bit over 12,600 up to 14,000. Uh, it's been very consistent the last two, couple of years in that 13,500 range. Uh, generally, we have found that our organic dairy cows are producing about two-thirds of the level of our conventional dairy cows. Smaller herd size, uh, we've seen the herd size in the study going up. That is not so much from the farms that are in the study getting bigger as it has been the inclusion of a couple larger farms in the study. So this does involve two farms that have over 200 cows. We have some farms in the study that only have 25 cows, but those farms have still continued to be quite profitable. But the bottom line here is the net farm revenue before anything is taken out for family cost of living we have seen this jump from 2004 from 28,000 to nearly 60,000 in 2008. A 60,000 net farm revenue does provide more than enough money for the family to pull family cost of living out of the uh, statistics, or pull that out of the farm account, and still have money left over for reinvestment. What have we seen over the last couple of years? Some of our farms are getting bigger, but more likely from bigger farms that are adopting organic. Milk per cow seems to be holding very steady on the farms that we've seen. We've seen this big milk price jump that I've just talked about, so our net revenue is up. We've also seen a net drop in net revenue in uh, 2007, and that is because of the high feed prices that have spilled over from the conventional grain markets into the organic grain markets. Organic grain runs normally about three times more than conventional grain if you're trying to buy grain for your cows. One key aspect to remember here in this data, we only have maybe one or two farms in this study in Vermont and Maine that are actually raising their own grain. For those of you in more southern regions of the country, we don't raise much grain up here. We raise corn for corn silage, and most of the farms that are in this study as organic dairy farms don't even bother raising any corn silage. It is nearly all hay, pasture, and hay silage. But a lot of things we need to take a look at. What's left over after you've gone through a year of production? So even whenever we're taking a look at $30 uh, per hundredweight milk prices, when you take a look at the cash expenses and accrual expenses, you end up taking a look at this on a per hundredweight basis. Even when you're getting 31 bucks a hundredweight, we have found our cost of production, and this includes depreciation, to be about $28 per hundredweight, leaving the farm with about $6.78 after we account the income that comes in from sale of dairy animals, call cows, and a little bit of other farm income. And so while family farm, uh, family living runs about $5.35 a hundredweight, out of that $6.78, we still have a dollar per hundredweight left over to pay for our other 
uh, costs and reinvestment and other options of what the dairy farm may want to uh, do some things with. So we did see net revenue decline. Our expenses are catching up to milk prices. And we've seen our total expenses, uh, particularly from 2008 uh, as compared to 2005, up nearly 15%. When we look at some of the major expenses, and these should surprise nobody that's involved with dairy farming, our feed, supplies and repairs, labor, interest, custom hire, utilities and fuel, they still account for 80% of the expenses. Uh, if you take a look at some of this stuff on an organic farm, you don't have fertilizer, you don't have chemicals, but you do have all the other expenses that you have on a conventional uh, dairy farm. And whenever we take a look at these farms in New England, we have to take into account that purchase feed is a very major cost, and 93% of that purchase feed uh, cost is grain. So if we could graze our own grain, it could probably lower the cost of production for some of these farms. So when we take a look at this, we're taking, uh, we've seen our feed account for uh, $9.40. That's uh, nearly 40% of your total expenses. And as compared to our others, uh, we have major expenses with repairs and supplies. Labor has interestingly gone down a little bit over the last couple of years. Interest has gone up. Uh, one of the things we've seen with interest going up, especially in 2006, when we saw milk prices go up, guess what? The farmers went out and spent more money. They reinvested in equipment. A lot of this, some of this equipment was financed, so we had some interest uh, going on. Uh, custom has gone up. Uh, we attribute that more to just an increase in custom that is used on a couple farms, not across the board. Now, if we take a look at how these things have changed, we've seen our feed prices go up nearly 27% since 2005. Our interest costs have gone up, but that's still a very minimal cost. Uh, custom has gone up a lot, but we attribute that to just a couple key farms. And we've seen our fuel price go up 40%. And anybody that buys gas for their car knows what, it's, uh, what we've seen at the gas pump the last couple of years with some of the price going up, down, peak price of oil, and then there's collapse. And so what have we seen here? Even though the farm revenue is up, we're seeing a lot of costs getting into the operation. Uh, we're seeing feed and fuel up significantly. Uh, we're seeing our interest up. We're seeing an increase uh, in investment of the farm profits. Now, Another way of looking at dairy economics is, you know, sometimes you look at it on a per hundred weight basis, sometimes we look at it on a farm basis, sometimes we look at it on a cow basis, but we still get the same story. One of the things that we're seeing here is that uh, the same story whenever you look at it on a per cow basis. We're still seeing our feed nearly $1,200, nearly $1,300 per cow, uh, and our repairs are our next higher cost but we still have to come up with our interest and in utilities and fuel costs on a per cow basis. Now, I mentioned about feed grain prices. A lot of the farmers here are purchasing 100% of their grain. That is characteristic of Maine and Vermont. We, we only have one farm in our study that raises their own grain. But we have seen this mix that farmers buy, whether the 12% or 16 or 18% protein mix, really takes some big jumps over the years. So we have actually seen, like from 2005 to 2009, we have actually seen the price jump 75%. Uh, this is also accompanied, as many of you that might be familiar with your conventional prices, we had conventional price of corn of $2.20 in 2005. We hit $7 a bushel in July of 2008, just before we saw the collapse of oil, and we saw all our ethanol plants in Iowa start going bankrupt because uh, they were paying too much for corn. Prices have dropped since then, but we're still seeing this very high increase in our feed grain prices that the farmers here in the Northeast, if you're going to be in the organic business, have to pay for the feed. Now, if feed is up 20 
seventy percent though, but we're only fee seeing that individual farm expenses are up only twenty seven percent. What's going on here? Well, anybody that's familiar with the farm and feeding, whenever the price of grain goes up, what do farmers do? They feed less grain per cow. And that's what we've found that has been a strategy of most of the farms. They're feeding less grain per cow. The farmers are also feeding a lower protein mix. It's cheaper. And there is a renewed focus on making better use of your forages. Try to get higher protein uh, in your hay and your haylage and try to make a little better use of your pasture. We have a number of farmers that say they're thinking about raising grains, but that has not really translated past the thinking stage yet. Most of our farmers here in the climate here in Vermont, and once you get into Maine, we can grow corn and cut it for silage. Cutting it for grain, unless you're right next to Lake Champlain or close to the ocean in, in Maine, you don't get enough degree days to raise commercial grain. It just doesn't work in most years. Um, what else can you do? While we're trying to um, raise your own grain, a number of farmers have thought about trying to go into a more seasonal milk production so that they can get their cows out in the spring when the grass is at its best nutritional level. But this has an impact. Our organic milk business is based on um, primarily on fluid milk. 93% of the organic milk goes to fluid milk. That means they have a seasonal supply and demand problem. We all know that milk consumption tends to go down during the summertime, starting in May, whenever the schools let out. This is not when processors want more milk. So seasonal milk production really is opposite of what the processors want. What we have a problem here is with uh, your situation, with the economics of uh, organic dairy, is that if you want to survive in this business, it has become a commodity. It is not a niche market. If you're going to survive, you have to be the lowest cost producer. Some people may not like that. But it does follow the economic theory that we're getting into milk production, that organic dairy is a commodity, and to be surviving in this business, you've got to keep those costs under control. Now, how does it compare to conventional? Well, anybody that's been watching the conventional market knows that we have been on one heck of a roller coaster the last, since 2004. 2004, conventional were far more profitable than organic. 2005, we're starting to see organic milk prices go up while conventional prices are coming down. 2006, we have low conventional milk prices while organic is still continuing to go up. That is when you really want it to be organic. That's why we saw in the state of Vermont, we saw nearly 80 farms begin their transition to organic just in 2006. 2007, conventional was slightly better, uh, but organic was still very competitive. Then starting in 2008, I'm not sure if anyone is quite aware, but we had a recession starting in 2008, and we saw the collapsing of conventional milk prices. By 2009, uh, what we're looking at right now is that the organic dairies that uh, we have the data from in 2009, these, the organic dairies in Vermont are cash flowing. Their profits are down a little bit. Some of them are facing quotas. But as compared to their neighbors that are in the conventional milk business, many of these farmers have lost hundreds of dollars per cow in 2009. And while things are getting a little better in the conventional side that they're approaching break even, they're still, in 2009, conventional dairy farms lost their shirts. They lost money in every 100 pounds of milk. They lost equity in their cows. They took on debt. And in many months, their milk checks didn't even cover the feed bill. So when we take a look at it in that perspective, you start understanding that uh, maybe it's a little baby better off to be organic. When we compare 2008 
these are some of the aspects that you have to look at with comparing organic to conventional. Yeah, organic is getting a much higher milk price. Milk per cow, though, for the conventional dairy farms is nearly 50% more, or organic farmers produce two-thirds of what conventional does, either way. Revenue per cow, interestingly, comes out not too far away. Organic's up a little bit at nearly $4,700. Then you look at the feed cost per cow. The organic dairy farmers are spending more feed per cow, but the conventional farmers are still spending a lot, but they're feeding a lot more grain per cow. Our vet medicine and breeding is much lower for the organic. Expenses per cow, though, the organic is just coming in a little slightly better. So when you look at net farm revenue, after all the accrual adjustments, we're seeing that the organic, as compared to conventional, uh, was clearing 900, over $900 per cow versus $500 for the conventional. But you still have this uh, responsibility of trying to make enough m money for a family cost of living. And so you still need to have the total number of cows that you need to make your family cost of living. Here's something that we looked at individually by taking a look at fuel prices. We looked at our uh, fuel prices and fuel expenses on a per cow basis between the conventional farms and the organic. In each of the years from 2004 to 2008, the organic dairy farms were spending anywhere from 24 to 51 percent less money on fuel than the conventional farmers are. Basically, the conventional farmers are spending a lot more on uh, fuel. They're spending a lot more on their fuel for their field crops, whereas most of the farms here in New England that are organic have stopped raising a lot of the field crops, which really lessens their demands for fuel. But on the other hand, think about whenever we uh, hear this major uh, discussion about sustainability. I've had some students tell me, well, gee, you know, organic farmers, because they don't use or, you know, so many fossil fuels, they're more sustainable. Well, when I go out on an organic farm, they're driving trucks that use gasoline. They're driving tractors that use diesel fuel. Maybe they don't use, they don't use any fertilizers, but they still use a heck of a lot of fuel to get their feed put up. And I don't know how sustainable they would be if they didn't have diesel fuel. They probably still would not be in business. Now, so some of these points on overviews on our organic farmers that what we've seen over the last number of years, our organic farmers tend to be a couple of years younger on average. We're seeing maybe a little higher degree of education. They definitely make greater use of grazing. One of the aspects here in Vermont and I'll make this uh, tribute for uh, NOFA, which is the primary certifier, they do more than just certify that you meet the organic standards. To get certified for organic production for milk in the state of Vermont, NOFA wants you to have a grazing plan, and they help you develop a grazing plan. That's not a USDA requirement, but it is a NOFA requirement. So they really want farmers to have a grazing plan that has a thought out method of how you're going to develop your pastures and your grazing and how you can manage it for greater efficiency and greater production. Fewer, few of our organic farms raise grain. Uh, in New England, it's too cold to raise grains, especially the, um, the corn. We are seeing a few more farms interested in growing soybeans, but not among our organic farms very much. Whenever we've asked the organic farmers about their decision to go organic, 93% of them are satisfied or very satisfied. We ask them about their future, nearly 90% of them plan on milking 10 years or more. And 85% 85, uh, 85 believe that organic is going to be more profitable for them in the long run. Another aspect of the organic dairy farms is if they would not be in business today, many of them would not be in business today if it wasn't for the option to go organic. And I think that's a very key point 
that we need to consider when we look at some of these organic farms. Many of our farms here in New England have limited acreage. They're located in narrow valleys where there is no other additional land available if they were to expand their herds. I was just at the farm last week where we were talking about what he would have done if he would have gone organic. He said, oh, I'd be out of business because of his resources, where his barn is, the land that he has available without the lack of additional land around him, he would have gone out of business. He would not be in business today had he not gone organic. And then we stop and think about that. If that's true of the majority of the 200 organic dairy farms in Vermont, we could probably say that we would have 150 fewer dairy farms today if we did not have the option to go organic. This keeps another operating dairy farm in the community. It keeps another farmer that is buying inputs in the community, another dairy farm that is in business and helping contribute to the tax base of the community. It's, it really has some spin-off effects with the community development aspect of our rural communities. Uh, grazing patterns, as I mentioned, if you're in uh, organic milk production, you have to graze your cows. NOFA Vermont requires farms to have a grazing plan. We have found out that about, through our surveying, that about 50% of the organic farmers move their cows to new grass every day. And whenever we took a look at we checked about the correlation between intensive grazing with profitability, we don't have, there's no correlation there. So whether it might be considered to be a better grazing management aspect, we have found that there's no definite difference between farm profitability and using intensive grazing management practices. Um, we just take a look at also some of the aspects in New England from the new grazing role that, has, uh, that will be taking effect. Because most of the organic farms in Vermont are already making very extensive use of grazing, we really don't consider much difference on the management practices of our farms in Vermont. Hopefully, uh, some of the farms in Vermont will benefit from maybe changes that may occur in other parts of the country with respect of implementation of the new grazing rule. Now, after this looks pretty good, but where is organic farming headed? God, what, don't we wish we would know? Do you know that there's a recession out there today? I think some of us do that. If you have a 401k or if, unless you've been totally ignoring the news, in two, fall 2008, the world turned upside down. Markets went to hell. We saw organic milk start dropping 15% instead of going up 20% per year that had been the rule for the previous couple of years. Let's face it, whenever people are unsure about whether they're going to have their own jobs or their spouse's jobs or worried about the future, they got a lot more choosy about their milk, about their money and how they spent their money for food. And we saw fewer people buying organic milk. If you're not sure of your job, you may decide that, that uh, conventional milk maybe is good enough for this month. There's also been an interesting aspect of organic milk with respect to RBST. Here in New England today, in the state of Vermont, you have to pay twice as much hauling if you want to use BST because that milk has to be hauled to a plant in western New York State. That's the only way that any processor in the New England area will not take any milk of which the producer is using RBST. Why is that? One of the aspects that several people have uh, put to is that organic milk was very successful in that it killed RBST. Simply put, because organic milk was rising in sales by so much, 20% per year, our other processors of conventional milk started looking at that and said, how can we capture part of that market? Well, one of the aspects of organic milk is it's hormone free or it doesn't contain RBST. We all know milk does have hormones in it. But 
we saw one processor after another start saying, I'm not taking any milk with RBST. We're going to try to capture part of that market. So when you go to the dairy cooler in a grocery store in anywhere in Vermont or in all across New England today, even the store brands have no RBST. You have to wonder a little bit, was organic milk so successful that it killed RBST, but it, did it hurt itself in its own respect that it maybe lost one of the attributes of which people use to buy uh, organic milk? Good question. I think it's a decent question. I don't have an answer for it. What's going on right now? Well, after we had the 20% decline in milk production, one of the things we saw was that uh, Hood canceled some contracts up through Maine. Most of these contracts with individual producers have now been picked up by Organic Valley. Horizon producers for the whole last year have they've been on edge. They're not sure what Horizon is going to be doing with uh, their uh, producers. Horizon did impose a uh, production quota. They wanted people to agree to production cuts. And some people were apparently told that you either agree to the cut or else you're not going to have your contract renewed. Uh, it doesn't put the farmer in a very good uh, negotiable position. Organic Valley has also imposed monthly quotas, which runs about like 7% below the three-year average of milk production. This has really hit some of the newest farmers the hardest because people that just came in in 2006 were not shipping organic milk until 2007. Uh, by the time they made some of their adjustments, they're not really up to maybe uh, you know a full production yet. So they've had some of their quotas based on the fact that they weren't uh, up to they weren't up to snuff yet. So it's been a little bit harder for them to adjust. Remember, you have a situation with the processors. If you can't sell your milk as organic milk, you can dump it in the conventional market, but you can't buy milk for $30 and sell it to the conventional market for $15 and last very long. We are starting to see some of this edge up a little bit now. I've been talking to a couple organic producers that even within the last two weeks indicated that uh, they may be asked to produce a little bit more milk for this fall uh, whenever milk product whenever milk demand increases. So it looks like we are getting a little bit of good news out there on the marketing front. Pricing situation, uh, price premiums have been cut. Uh, Organic Valley has even imposed uh, hauling costs before. None of the farmers had to pay hauling. Horizon still is not uh, charging hauling for individual farmers. So in 2009, we expect the income to be down, expenses up, and that is what we're finding from our early uh, farms that we're looking at for this year. Another aspect of organic dairy farming, whenever the conventional market goes to hell and we have MILC payments, organic dairy farmers are eligible for MILC payments, and this has been beneficial for these farmers for the last year. So organic farms, if they don't like the market situation, they have very few options. The conventional market, last year some of the farms were losing $700 per cow for the year. Uh, organic farmers that lose their organic contract, they really have nowhere to go. We have others that are facing cutbacks due to their monthly quota. They really don't have much choice if they want to remain in organic milk production. Uh, some of them are thinking about maybe selling more raw milk, but it's kind of interesting. Some of the contracts with some of the processors has in that they are the exclusive buyer of your milk. And several farmers have asked, well, if I sell raw milk out of the tank, what does that mean? Well, it means technically you're in violation of your contract. We still have the situation of the market imbalance that we have seen Organic Valley, and I think Horizon may also put a premium on milk that is produced from November to February. That's when they want the milk. That's when they're selling most of the fluid milk. 
So what are we seeing? Overall, organic farmers are still cash flowing. The least profitable organic dairy farms are, they're in trouble. And the same with conventional farms, there's a range of profitability whenever we just look at just the, the averages. There are some that are unprofitable. There are some organic dairy farms that are selling out. They're thinking that uh, maybe some of the good days are over. Every time that you're seeing a market go down, there's a lower equity uh, from lower cow values. Definitely no one is planning any expansions in the organic dairy business, and the organic processors are not taking on any new farms right now. You can imagine what it would be like if uh, conventional farms could transition to organic right now. We'd have such a stampede, we wouldn't know what to do with it. So the future from a regional perspective, how does organic fit in with the future of small dairy farms in the Northeast? It's been a lifesaver for a lot of our smaller farms. Will it continue? A lot of our town and community and our state legislators hope so because it keeps some of these farms in business. They would not be in business had they not gone organic. It's had an impact on the community and on uh, suppliers. It's a great combination for the region here in New England where you're characterized by small farms without any options of expanding whenever you have a lot of land being used up and a land is very expensive close to our urban uh, population centers. From a national perspective, it's really conventional. You don't want to go from organic to conventional at this point. Many f conventional farmers would still convert to organic if they could. We still have the dilemma with some of the larger organic farms in the West. Organic milk in Walmart, what does that mean? Well, that's giving us another uh, situation because organic in Walmart at the lowest price, price to the consumer, does that really help the farmer? Some people are not too happy about that. There's some critics of that. Uh, the restrictive grazing rule, uh, if this makes things tougher for some of the larger farms in the West, uh, from a regional perspective, I think this would be advantageous to a lot of our smaller organic farms. Uh, of course, if I was from the western states and was representing some of the larger organic dairy farms, I wouldn't have that uh, type of attitude, but I'm from New England. So we're getting back down basically Dairy Economics 101. Organic milk is a commodity. Some farms are going to survive. We're, we're seeing quite a range of profitability. I kind of think of this a little bit. Maybe if we start allowing more farms into it, we might see a lowering of the organic milk price. I can see now, 10 years from now, two organic farmers meeting at the feed store and they're being a little nostalgic, and will they be looking back and saying, yep, I remember that year in 2006. Boy, things were pretty good then. Boy, if we had those days now, we'd be making some money instead of uh, losing everything and losing our shirts. Will they be saying that? I don't know. That's a real good question of where the organic sector is going to go. For those that are staying in business, how do you stay in business? You have to be the low-cost producer. Can you be diversified and bring in money in other ways? Those are some things that you might have to think about. Raising grain can potentially lower costs for New England. I think many of our farms raising a small amount of grain is going to be more costly than what it's going to be worth for them. Can we get into raw milk? We're around a region that seems to have a growing demand for raw milk. A uh, number of issues there from health, the legality. Can we make maximum use of our pastures? Well, we can, but we can't be maximizing to the point that we're on seasonal milk production for a large number of farms. What, what other options are there? Well, the farmers need to be creative and try to figure out what is working best for them. That's what I've covered for this. I'd like to thank you for listening in and uh, try to take any questions at this time.
Great. Thank you, Bob. So um, as Bob said, we'll now have some time for our question and answers. And for those of you who may have missed the beginning of the presentation, um, the way we are taking questions is you um, all you need to do is just type your questions into the question box that should appear on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, so you just type those in and hit return. If for some reason the, the question box is closed, um, just look for the word questions. And um, there should be a, a plus or minus sign. You just click on that little um, plus sign to open up the, the question box. So um, and I'll just be reading uh, the questions aloud to Bob. And he will answer as many questions as you have or as many um, that we have time for. So type away. And we don't have any questions in the question box right now. Oh, here we go. Great. So um, the first question, Bob, that we have is, do you know anything about organic dairy farming in the south? Not much. <laughs> I do know that uh, there were a number of farms that were considering uh, getting into organic dairy in the Virginia the Shenandoah Valley. Now, of course, some people may not even consider that south. I know when I was at Virginia Tech, one ex explanation I got that uh, most of the people in the south consider Virginia to be north, and most of the people in the north consider Virginia to be south. So uh, I'm not sure if that market ever took off. It was supposed to be development, I think, of an empty milk plant down there, and I'm not really sure if that really has ever taken effect there. I know there is some organic milk production in Maryland. But going further south, uh, I really don't know of any organic dairy farms from North Carolina to Florida. OK. Um, and, and I as well. There's uh, very few as, as far as I understand. Um, next question is, do you identify any outstanding farmers that might point towards successful strategies for the future? You know, the strategies are very same as what they were for conventional. Our, I would say our most uh, profitable organic farms were also profitable conventional farms. And a lot of it is just uh, keeping your costs under control. It's amazing how you go from farm to farm and you see you pull in and they seem to have the same herd size. One farm's going to spend twenty thousand dollars on repairs, and the other farm spends about three thousand. Uh, it's just incredible. Whenever you take a look at the finances of some individual farms, you think look alike. And anyone that I think is familiar with this is it still seems to come down to the individual management skills of the farmer. It's not necessarily what you're selling. And uh, you know, I kind of hate to see this hate to say that, but uh, a lot of people have gone this, through this for years. You know, what, it, what do I need to do to make money? Well, uh, some of our guys that are good managers, they tend to be low debt. I don't think they're low debt because they inherited the farm. They're low debt because they've paid off their debts. So uh, it really comes down to a lot of individual management. We have some farms in this study that are producing a $40,000 $40, profit or $45,000 profit, and they're milking fewer than 30 cows. Great. Bob, and just to follow up with that, too, um, uh, if folks aren't aware, the Northeast Organic Dairy Producers Alliance um, um, publishes uh, farmer profiles on their website. So that might be something to take a look if you're interested in reading farmer stories. Um, you could find the NOTPA um, website at uh, organicmilk.org. I don't think it's on that additional resources piece. OK, so next question is, would more processed product um, increase organic profitability? And, and related to that, there was another question that says, um, are value-added products like butter, cheese, yogurt, or bottling providing uh, safer markets for producers? OK. One of the problems that we, I think that we've seen with organic dairy is that 90, over 90 percent of its milk goes, into, uh, goes to fluid milk, which means that whenever you have surplus production, you can't put it into 
some of the products that you could make storable commodities out of, like cheese or yogurts. And so you have a situation that if we could get a little bit more demand for organic products, it would help the organic milk price and would help offset the seasonal imbalance that we have between supply and demand. Now, the question is, can you make uh, are consumers as picky about organic cheese as what they would be for organic milk? And the answer to that so far has tended to be that, uh, you know, that maybe the consumer isn't quite as willing to spend the extra money for organic cheese nearly as much as they're willing to spend the money for organic milk. Why? I don't know. I do know that uh, there's a study starting here at the University of Vermont that is going to be trying to examine uh, consumer attitudes toward some of the organic milk products you know, that would be coming from processing and see uh, what are some of the uh, cons consumer attributes and trying to identify if there's any barriers toward increasing sales of like organic cheese and other organic dairy products. Deb, could you repeat the second part of that question, please? Um, I, I think you answered it, but it, it was um, our value-added products like butter, cheese, uh, and yogurt or bottling providing safer markets for producers. Um, I think what that uh, question refers to is whether you are having on, any on-farm processing. Mm -hmm. Now, in this study, we did not include any of the farms that are involved with on-farm processing. Now. In the state of Vermont, we do have a large number, well, it's a sizable number. We have about 50 maybe artisan cheese makers. We, we have one organic dairy fluid milk bottler that's a farm processor bottler. And uh, we have a couple that are in and one primarily that is in the yogurt business. Uh, that has been successful for those farms. One of the things that is of concern is it is a huge investment to get into milk bottling. You know, setting up your equipment uh, can easily run into several hundred thousand dollars just to get your pasteurizer and uh, bottling machine set up. And you don't use it very much if you're just using it for your individual farm. Now, it, you can capture a local market that way. But one of the things that you have a concern with is that if you go to the, uh, your dairy case or go to your co-op store or wherever you're buying your organic milk and there is 10 different farms and they're selling their own milk, are they going to be able to command a higher price? They're going to be competing against each other in price. So there is a point where you can, if you're the only business in town that is selling organic milk that is produced on your own farm, Yes, it is probably an advantage and it is likely more profitable. If there's 10, store, 10 farms trying to do it in your town, uh, probably you're not going to get any more than what you would if you were just producing the milk and sending it on to a processor. Great. Thank you, Bob. Um, so we just had a little comment from, um, based on that question about um, dairy, um, organic dairies in the south. Um, Marty writes, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Kentucky do have some organic dairies currently, though they are, there are few in North Carolina and Tennessee. The Kentucky organic dairy community is developing quickly. So thanks for that, Marty, um, for writing that in. Um, OK, so our next question, um, can you explain the more restrictive grazing rule? Um, I don't consider myself an authority on it, but I believe it has in it that there uh, that animals have to get, I think, 30% of their dry matter consumption from pasture mm -hmm. uh, during the uh, growing season. 120 days. 120 days, okay. Yep. And um, just so you know, uh, Robert, who posed the question, um, we had a uh, webinar on this topic um, last month, and hopefully we'll be posting that um, archive soon. It was presented by... Um, uh, one of the folks from the USDA National Organic Program, and we're hoping to um, at least offer one follow-up webinar on that issue um, coming up in the next few few weeks, months. So just be looking for that. 
So you want to maybe go to the um, eOrganic website that's posted on the screen and, and take a look. Okay. Um, okay, so we have another comment from David in Minnesota, uh, Minnesota who says, um, Bob, your numbers of expenses and revenues match up with numbers collected in Minnesota. Production per cow is a little less, but our growing degree days are just long enough or just long enough for short season corn grain. So thanks, David. Any comments on that, Bob? Well, uh, our problem here is, yeah, some farmers can grow short season grain corn if you're next to Lake Champlain. If you're up in the mountains here, forget it. And so uh, short season grains are helpful for some of the farmers in some locations. Our problem is that we get some years that the corn just sits there in September and doesn't mature, that it's just not warm enough, and then you have the problem of, you know, the only other option is to harvest it for corn silage if it doesn't mature. And also, we don't have the infrastructure here for handling grain. We don't have dryers. We have very few people that have combines. So. Uh, because very few people raise grains here, we don't have the planters, the harvesting equipment, or the storage equipment so that if you did get uh, uh, wet, damp corn, uh, you couldn't, you'd have a hard time even finding a place to go and set it up for drying. So a lot of infrastructure problems that we don't have because we don't raise much grain corn. Okay, great. Um, so this question, um, I'm, I want to make sure I have this clear. Um, Tim from Purdue is asking, um, in New England, what is the average cost of organic cows slash head? Does that make sense to you? Cows per head, cow, I'm thinking he's talking about what, what they are the average costs of the animals. Uh, I talked to a farmer yesterday who just bought 20 head and they paid $1,200 a piece. And has this and, also dropped since uh, 2006? Yes. If you, uh, about 2007, 2008, uh, we had people selling organic cows for $2,500 or more. Okay. Tim, I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't, just um, tap, tap in another question, please. Um, okay, so this question says, you said there's no correlation between grazing intensity and profitability. How did you measure the, level, the levels of grazing intensity? For example, moving twice per day, once per day, every other day? Do you have any uh, on that? We were taking a look at anybody who moved their cows to fresh grass once a day or more. And we took a correlation of that, and then we took a correlation with all those that moved their cows uh, you know, at least every two days for a shorter time period. So when I said more, that was more. I mean, I, let me rephrase that. What we're taking a look at first was those that move their cows to fresh grass at least once a day or two times a day or maybe more often. And then we included everybody that moved their cows at least every two days to fresh grass. And we ended up with a correlation of something like 0.1. And so when your correlation runs from 1 to minus 1, a correlation of minus 1 tells you there's, there's no correlation there. OK, this question um, says, uh, with the quota reduction being forced onto uh, organic producers, can these producers utilize this excess um, for their own marketing? cheese, butter, etc. Interesting question. But I have seen one of the contracts, several contracts from one processor that specifically forbids you to sell any of your milk to anyone else. That contract makes them the exclusive buyer of your milk, which in a way infers that you can't sell milk even as raw milk to your neighbor although they're being told that you know you don't have to worry about what you sell to your neighbor but if you start selling 10 or 20 percent of your milk you're actually in violation of that contract hmm. now uh, there are people that do uh, maybe like make some of their own cheese and they have found a processor that will take their their extra milk 
and therefore they've gotten around that. So yes, you would have to work out the option, but you would have to ha be with one of the processors that allows that in the contract. Okay. And um, this one, just to follow up, you might have just answered that. I'm sorry, I was paying attention to the question box. Are there any instances of processors taking a hard stance on those farmers? Using their own unsold milk for other products. No, I've never yeah. heard. I've never heard of anyone really taking a hard stance on that. Okay. Um, is anyone seeing dual-purpose cattle helping to offset their dairy losses? Uh, no. I have not come across that. Okay. Although, whenever you're out on these farms, I have seen every crossbreed that you could possibly get. You know using international genetics, you know, Dutch belted or New Zealand genetics. I've seen every cross between our major breeds that you could imagine, and I wouldn't be surprised that some of our farmers would probably even try crossbreeding them with moose if they thought they could get a little higher milk production or a better <laughs> grazing animal. Okay. Oh, and Tim um, follows up. Um, about the question about cows, organic cows, um, just said the change from uh, 2,500 to um, 1,200 a cow mirrors what has happened to the conventional cows, but five times the magnitude. So thanks for that response, Tim. Mm -hmm. And um, a question about uh, uh, farmers raising their own grains. Do you have any economic data on, on that, Bob, grain production for livestock feed? For, uh, for, for organic farms, yeah. I have a little bit of data from a sample of one. <laughs> okay. So, and uh, he is in it at a large scale. He has a combine, and uh, he is also working closely with, uh, no, I guess, yeah, this individual is Will, working with uh, also one of our agronomists, Heather Darby, who's doing a lot of research on organic grains. And uh, I don't know, I, I'm not sure if half his stuff might even be considered to be research rather than farm application, but he is trying to raise the right combination because there again, what kind of seed corn do you raise? Uh, we have another farmer, Jack Laser, in the state of Vermont that has really made a good market for trying to look at uh, what are they called? Uh, I forget the word right now. But the local vor. Local vor. No, the type of seeds. Uh, did I heritage seeds oh. in corn and other crops that uh, that he said that were at one time much better suited for the northeast. So, yeah, these two are doing a lot, but uh, I don't have much figures on their cost of production. And, and for folks that might be interested, we have a farmer, an emerging farmer group um, here in Vermont called the Northern Grain Growers Association who have been really committed to grain um, production for both human consumption as well as livestock feed. So that is coming out. And, and our, 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 our brothers and sisters over in Maine have also, at the um, University of Maine, have also been taking a look at grain production. So it's really an, an, an area of interest certainly to folks here in the region, also some research being done in North Carolina as well, so on or specifically on organic grain production, and just so folks know. Um, any more questions? I don't see any more questions in our, in our question box at this time. I'll give folks maybe one more minute. Okay, and with that, I guess we're going to close our this webinar. Um, thank you again, Bob, for your presentation, and thanks to all of you for, for coming. Um, uh, we wanted to make sure that you have these two links that are up on the screen. Um, the first one, a comparative analysis of organic dairy farms in Maine and Vermont, was um, the publication um, uh, um, basically publicizes the uh, results that Bob and his um, colleagues from Maine and, and Vermont um, from that um, USDA integrated organic um, program study. And then we have our eOrganic um, link up there also on the screen. That's www.eextension.org slash 
organic underscore production. And take a look at that for our articles. Uh, we have dairy and economics articles and other types of articles, clearly. And um, this webinar will be posted on that site as well as um, our webinars to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs>